we understand the biblical definition of a disciple and the call given to every believer to journey into becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay, are we excited to be in the house of the Lord? Anyone? Yeah, come on. Just encourage me as I go on. Uh, that would be great. Okay, if you have your Bibles, can you turn with me to Ezekiel 37? It's a very familiar passage of scripture. And if you're there, you can just give me a thumbs up. That would be great. Oh, we already got some fast turners here. Nice, that's awesome. I'll just read it, and if you're there, you can follow with me. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out into the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And I just skip to verse 7, it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Amen? You know, um, I was just thinking, you know, what does dry bones signify? And uh, I think in the most simplest terms, it's, it means no despair, right? No hope. Um, you know, if you witness an accident, um, and if you see a man motionless, you know, you, know you, you might still think there's hope, right? You might revive him, like, you know, do some CPR. But if you saw, let's say, a skeleton on the road, you know, you would think there's absolutely no hope, right? You, would, you wouldn't even consider reviving dry bones. But God... He is the God of the breakthrough. The impossible is no issue. I'm going to say that again. He is the God of the breakthrough. The impossible is no issue. Come on, can I hear an amen for that? That's what I'm talking about. His word contains power to restore and heal. You know, I'll just read the verse 4 again. It says, hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So I think church, it's time to, you know, to get on the offensive. You know, if you're suffering with some affliction in your mind and your body. Can you declare, I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm delivered? You know, if you're suffering from a defeat in an area, can you still say, God, I'm victorious, I'm prosperous, I'm triumphant? Come on, church, can we say that with full of faith? So can we rise to our feet and we're just going to stand up and wave your Bibles in the air with full of faith, loud, bold, and strong? I need to get the declaration and <laughs> just getting carried away. Okay, come on. Let me see those Bibles and let's say this with me. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I'll become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. I present myself as a new wineskin to receive the new wine and fresh oil being poured out on me. God releases new things and a new work of His Spirit in me and through me. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Come on. While you're standing, can we just welcome Pastor and uh, as he ministers yeah, yeah, the word yeah, of the you. Lord? Yeah, come Good on, make job, some noise. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. May be seated. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate it. So we're getting them ready, train them up. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I want to just share of some testimonies that came in, in the recent week. Do you like testimonies? I think it's really wonderful to hear uh, stories come back, of what God is doing, the lives of people. Uh, so I'm just going to share some of these testimonies that came by email. Now, you know, we do hear people share with us, but I, I, I prefer sharing the things that came by email because then uh, if anybody asks evidence, you, know, you can say, 
I have it here that this actually uh, was sent to us, and uh, we are not making these stories up. So here's a testimony from a college student that came on the 29th of February. Here's what she wrote. She says, I was suffering from severe anxiety attacks for the month of August, uh, from the month of August last year, uh, when I had minor clashes with my roommate. All of a sudden, one day, she did something which I wasn't comfortable at all and had no say in the matter. Uh, the anxiety kept building up and affected me so much that I was scared to enter my own room. And I really messed up my internals or tests. Uh, it was during this time that the sermons preached were on overcoming fear for two consecutive weeks. It was very encouraging and helped me overcome my fear. The following week, the anxiety attacks got so bad that I lost weight drastically. I desperately needed the help of a counselor. I was just wondering what to do, but God has been so good. He kept speaking to me through every sermon, and the next week, the sermon was about overcoming anxiety. I listened to it, came back, and listened to it several times, and read the sermon notes every day for 10 days. Now, I'm delivered from all anxiety attacks, though the situation is still unpleasant. God has granted me peace in the middle of the storm. The daily devotions that's on the church app uh, also were all on peace and helped me get stronger too. God has indeed delivered me through the Sunday sermon and notes. Like all glory to God for this miracle. Amen? Wonderful to hear that. Uh, this testimony came from another young lady. This was on March 2nd. She wrote, I want to testify to my healing. I had knee pain in my right knee, which was troubling me during walking, and especially while stepping down from the stairs. On the 26th of January, Sunday, when I was coming out of this auditorium, I could feel no pain. and knew I was healed. It's been a month now, even after having a long trip, sitting in the plane, walking almost five kilometers every day. I have no pain, and I'm walking with strength and freedom. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Uh, the next testimony might be a little funny, but it's still very powerful. This is from a young lady, 31 years old. This came in on the 4th of March. This is what she says. She says, I am 31 years old. I was battling the fear of cockroach since my childhood. The moment a cockroach passed by, I used to hop over beds or sofas to feel safe. Five years back, a pastor from, and she mentions the name of a certain church, uh, prayed for me to help overcome this fear, but unfortunately, nothing worked. Over the past few weeks, I've been listening to the sermons regularly. I've listened to the series of, of overcoming fear, depression, and anxiety. It has truly impacted me. During these times, I had a strong urge or an inner voice within me telling me, you have been listening to the series of overcoming fear. Why don't you kill a cockroach? <laughs> I ignored this voice, but today... I encountered a cockroach near my leg, and to my surprise, I killed it. I do not know how I did it, but I felt a strong force within me which urged me to kill it. The moment I killed it, I felt an enormous amount of joy within me. Not because I killed the cockroach, but because I overcame a fear. I felt like an overcomer. And a Bible verse started constantly striking within me. He who is born of God overcomes the world. This incident has impacted my mind tremendously. And I feel immense peace in my mind for all areas of my life. All glory and honor belong to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks for guiding us to this amazing series of overcoming fear. Amen. You know, it might seem like a small thing. But for this person, it is a big thing. And God helps us conquer or kill our lions and bears before he helps us kill our Goliaths. Amen? One last testimony that came in on the uh, 7th of March. Uh, this person wrote, I would like to share my experience in the past two months as we were going through the series on overcoming negative emotions. I've been suffering from gastritis and allergy issues for the past three years. Uh, these health issues uh, gave in to stress and anxiety. I had panic attacks. Uh, and some fear was gripping my mind now and then. Uh, though I was taking medication, I was not healed completely. Further, I also became anxious in a closed auditorium or theater. After we moved to Good Shepherd Auditorium in the first week of January, I had a panic attack when the sermon was going on. From the next week onwards, I started fearing to come to church 
thinking of what happened the previous week. Uh, when we started a series, uh, Overcoming Fear, part one, I was not well and didn't come to church, but connected online. On hearing the sermon, I felt it was tailor-made for me. The next Sunday, I attended the church without fail to hear part two. Uh, when pastor prayed to the congregation, I felt God touching me and tearing down my fears. The next Sunday, when I walked in the church, I felt so relaxed and comfortable. I praised God for removing my anxiety. I felt God speaking to me in the next consecutive sermons on anxiety and depression. For the past two weeks, I heard all the sermons again, made notes, and tried to recollect them whenever the thought of fear or anxiety tried to grip me. God has made me realize that emotional health is most important for physical well-being. Also, during the healing prayer on February 25th, I prayed to God to heal me from menstrual problems I was facing. I was healed on the very same day. Praise God for all His love and mercy. Amen. God works by His Word. Let's all say that together. God works by His Word. You see, His Word is powerful. Amen. So as the Word is being preached... That word carries God's power. And it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit, of course, that accompanies the word that is preached, uh, that begins to you know, do God's work in our lives. And, and that's why God's word uh, preached under the power of the Holy Spirit is so important. We honor the word of God. Amen? All right. Thank you for those few amens. <laughs> All right. You can be a little noisy in chat. It's okay. All right. You can make some sounds. You can say hallelujah, whatever. Clap your hands if you like, um, <coughs> and uh, uh, just enjoy the Word of God. All right, starting today and over the next, <coughs> sorry, the water went to the wrong, <laughs> the wrong way, okay, wrong passage. All right, it's clear. Starting today, over the next few Sundays, we're going to uh, address a very important topic, but it may not be a very popular theme. Uh, but it's a very important thing. We're going to talk about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Everybody say, a disciple. All right. Everybody say, a disciple of Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about what it means to be a disciple. Uh, talking about the call that Jesus gave to us. Uh, that He called us to be disciples. Uh, what is the process involved of becoming a disciple, of growing into a disciple? And what are the fruits, the outcomes, uh, the evidence of somebody being a disciple? You know, I trust that almost uh, every person here this morning has made a decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and a Savior. You know, we've heard the gospel. We heard that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so we have believed in Jesus uh, and He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And uh, that's important, but that's not the destination. That's actually the starting point of what He has called us into. And what I want to impress on our hearts this morning is that Jesus has called each one of us to be His disciples. That's what I want to emphasize and maybe help us understand a little bit of what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So let's all say this together. The Lord Jesus has called us to be His disciples and not just believe us. When Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, many of us are very familiar with this. Uh, Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. Uh, let's read it out together. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he said, Go and make disciples disciples, right? Not just believers, not just church attenders, uh, not just get them into your, you know, uh, your congregation. No, go make disciples. And it's very interesting when you look at that, that word in the Greek, 
Uh, it's not the regular word for teaching. He didn't say go and teach people or tell people or proclaim. It's not that simple word. It's really the Greek word there uh, when he's, that's used for make disciples. Uh, it's really a word that has the idea of becoming a disciple by enrolling or signing up. I'm just using common English words today. Uh, by enrolling to be a, a learner, a pupil, a student. So when he says go and make disciples, he says go and get people to commit to becoming a disciple by enrolling into a process by which they're going to learn, which will transform them into becoming disciples. So go make disciples. Get them to come in. Commit to this. Enroll them into this uh, process of becoming disciples. So he wasn't saying just go and announce the good news, which we do, and it's important to announce the good news. It's important to proclaim the gospel. But our goal is... We want them to take this step to say, I am going to become a disciple. Go and make disciples. Get them into this so that they can become disciples. And part of that, he says next is, you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, baptism is symbolic. I mean, it, it has its own meaning, but uh, it's, it's also very symbolic. When you are baptized, the word baptized there means immerse, not sprinkles. I leave it there. Immerse is very important because when you are immersed, all of you goes in. You don't have your hand and feet sticking out. That is not an option. Immerse, immersed, baptized is all of you into the God of the Bible, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You're saying, I am committing. My whole being to this, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then, as part of the process, verse 20, teaching them to observe. So this word teaching is, okay, the instruction part. So as a part of becoming a disciple, you are immersed. You first have to commit to it completely. And then there is this uh, instruction that you keep receiving that will help you become this disciple, teaching them to observe everything that Jesus has commanded or given to us. But the goal, what he told us is, go and make disciples. Now, there's a lot that the Lord Jesus spoke about becoming a disciple. And uh, yeah, we are going to explore that in the weeks to come. Uh, but what is very really interesting is this. Once he commissioned the disciples and they went out, throughout the book of Acts... You don't find people being referred to as believers. You find the word disciple being used. Now, we commonly use the word believer. Are you a believer? Yes. Hello, I'm also a believer. And say, good. <laughs> we use the word believer very often. That's okay. We understand what you're talking about. But the book of Acts uses the word disciple. Throughout the book of Acts. To reference people who are following Jesus. He uses the word disciple. Disciple disciple. Meaning these are not people who just believed on the name of Jesus Christ. They committed themselves wholeheartedly to being disciples of Christ. And you know the reference in Acts 11 verse 26, the latter part of that verse, it says, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The disciples are called Christians. So if somebody asks you, are you a Christian? Biblically, they're asking you, are you a disciple? Are you a Christian? Are you a disciple? That's what they're asking you. Because it's the disciples who are called Christians. Now you know what you're saying when you say, I am a Christian. You're really saying, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what you're saying. Uh, we use it very loosely, believer and Christian, all that. But biblically, what you are saying is, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I've signed up. I'm in it. All of me. So, disciple, what does it mean? What, 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 what does it entail? And uh, as I mentioned, Jesus spoke a lot about it, but I want to bring our attention to one 
passage of Scripture that kind of very succinctly uh, defines for us what it means to be a disciple. So this is Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. Let's pause there. Look at that verse 25 again. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. So who is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who's committed to this process of becoming like his teacher or his master. So as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you and I have committed to this process of becoming like Jesus. And Jesus said, it is sufficient. It's enough. I'm not asking anything more. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher or his master. So really, disciples are imitators of their teacher. Disciples are imitators. They're becoming like their teacher or master. So as disciples, you and I, disciples of Jesus, you and I are imitators of Jesus. We are in this journey. Uh, we are in this process, a transformative process of becoming like our teacher and our master. So we are learners and followers of Jesus, committed to being like Him. So we committed to understanding His heart, to knowing His mind, living for His purposes, uh, living life the way He wants us to live, and doing uh, uh, the works He wants us to do. That's a disciple. Jesus said it's enough for a disciple that he be like His teacher. So this is what you and I are called to. We are called to this journey of becoming like Jesus. That's a disciple. Are you with me? And Jesus said, it's enough that you be like the teacher, the master. It's sufficient for us to be like him. Now, just think about the impact and influence this would have. On everything. So think about the family. Think about the home. Where the husband, the wife. Is a disciple of Jesus Christ. I mean they are committed. To becoming like Jesus. So in the home. When there is an occasion or a moment for strife. For holy fighting. <laughs> The husband, the wife says, I'm committed to being like Jesus. So your response in that situation will, will be shaped, will be determined, will be influenced by your commitment to being like Jesus. So even in this situation, in my home, I will respond the way Jesus wants me to respond. Amen? Why? Because you are a disciple. Yes, you're a husband, you're a father, but you're also a disciple. Think about the impact it will have on, 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 on parenting and how parents treat their children. Uh, the father, the mother, they are disciples of Jesus. And so they want to show that in how they treat their children. They're imitators of Jesus, so even in that relationship. Think about the impact this will have on the workplace. When you go to your workplace, whatever your role is, uh, whatever your responsibility is, and whatever your place of influence is, you are a disciple of Jesus. So people will see why you don't make those, you know, uh, those kinds of dealings, why you don't engage in those kinds of practices. Why are you different? Because you are a disciple, even in the workplace. A disciple of Jesus. Amen? So it, it'll have a tremendous impact. And you know, a time will come when people will say, I see Jesus in you. 
Wouldn't that be wonderful? Because you are a disciple. And that's a good thing. That you are being so transformed to be like your master, your teacher. That people say, I see Jesus in you. Or at least something of Jesus in you. I see that. Why? Because you're a disciple. Amen? And that is what he's calling all of us to. You have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but his invitation, his call to you is not just to be a believer. His call to you and me is to be his disciple, to become an imitator, to grow and mature into becoming like him uh, till every, every aspect of our life it flows out of that commitment to being his disciple. And you know, the Bible tells us that this is actually the Father's plan from before the ages. And I'll just reference one verse here in Romans, the 8th chapter, uh, the 29th verse. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. One reason... The eternal word who was God became the son of God. It shows that the sons of God will know what they are really to look like. I'll repeat it again. One reason why the eternal word became the son of God is so that the sons of God will know what they should really look like. They should look like their elder brother. He says, the Bible says here, verse 29, whom he foreknew, he predestined. I mean, he knew ahead, he planned ahead that this is what I'm going to design to do. That all of us who believe in Jesus, we should be fashioned into the same image of Jesus Christ. So that he is the firstborn among many brethren. So can you imagine? You can go around saying, Jesus is my elder brother. And you're right. Amen? And that's God's, that was God's plan. Now, you know, if you have a couple of brothers like Sam, Jerry, and maybe. <laughs> they have their own distinctiveness. They're three brothers, in case you're wondering whom I'm referring to. <laughs> they are these three brothers from our South Location. Each one has their own distinctives, but they all have certain common things. You can tell, hey, they're brothers. They're from the same house. They're all very committed to Jesus Christ. That's a great thing. Amen? Uh, you can tell. Maybe they walk alike. They probably have a similar gait, you know, <laughs> or certain, certain things. You can say, hey, they are brothers. <laughs> God. Wants us to be like Jesus. That's what he planned ahead of time. So the eternal word became a man. So that the sons of men could know their true identity. Or what they should really be like. Be like him. The first man messed it up. But here's the man. The prototype. Be like him. So that was God's plan for the ages. That we all become like Jesus Christ. So in this introductory message, I want to just touch on a few side notes. One of them is, you know, what discipleship is not. There's three, three simple things here just to, you know, uh, clarify and help us understand what we're getting into. What discipleship is not. Number one is, a discipleship is not following a set of do's and don'ts. You see, in some Christian circles, the moment they start talking about discipleship, it's all immediately all about how long your hair should be, whether you should wear gold or not, you know, what kind of clothes you wear, how long the skirt should be, whether you're allowed to wear sleeveless in church or not. I mean, for them, discipleship is all this. It's a set of rules, do's and don'ts. But listen, that's not what the Bible says. Is talking about. When the Bible talks about being a disciple, it's talking about you, the person inside the clothes, being changed into the image of Jesus Christ. 
that's more important. And of course, it will come out in the way you conduct yourself. And that we will leave the choice to you. Because once you decide to be like Jesus, he'll tell you what to do. We don't have to dictate that. Amen. So discipleship is not about rules and do's and don'ts. It's about you being changed into the image of Jesus Christ. Secondly, what discipleship is not, is not selective adherence. It's not like, you know, Jesus gave us these 100 things and says, okay, you pick what you want, it's enough. No. Discipleship is 100% commitment. It's immersion. You're all in. So it's not like, you know, uh, I will take these things that I like and I think I can handle. Uh, but these things, sorry, I didn't sign up for it. No. Either you're 100% in or you're out. It's not selective. It's not, I'm giving you a menu, what do you like? That's not discipleship. Amen? Amen. It's 100% commitment to becoming like Jesus, head to toe, spirit, soul, body, amen. And lastly, uh, discipleship is not a retainer program of the local church. Some people think, oh, he's talking about discipleship because he wants to make sure I come to church. Listen, that's not the point. It's not like we're trying to get you to sign up to something to, so that we make sure you know, you, you're, you're committed to this church. No. The local church exists to help you in your journey of discipleship. We're not here to force you to commit to the church. No. We're here to help you, assist you. But you are on a journey. Your journey is to become like Jesus. So we're not using, and we're not talking about discipleship to get you to commit to the church. We're talking about discipleship to get you to commit to becoming like the master. And we're here to help you in that journey. Together, we're going to journey into this. Amen? Now, another side thing we want to address, of course, is uh, to overcome some practical challenges when we talk about discipleship. Some of the challenges you and I will face, the hindrances uh, that we will face, of course, first is, uh, I have no time for this. This is too demanding. You know, uh, I can come to church on Sundays, but uh, Pastor, you don't know my life. Monday to Saturday, I am so busy. I have no time for this. This is too much for me. And that's a hindrance. That's something that actually prevents us from making this journey. But I want to challenge you this morning that your yes to Jesus must be so, so strong that you're willing to make the time, you're willing to pay the price to make this journey to becoming like Him. Amen? That, yes, we're all busy. Yes, we have other things to do in life. We have responsibilities. But, spiritually, you have made a commitment saying, I am going to take this journey to be like Jesus. And I'm willing to go through the process. We'll talk about the process next Sunday. But it does require time. Like anything that you would want to commit to, anything that's worth pursuing, it requires time. It requires a certain amount of commitment. And this is one of those things that are really worth it, becoming like Jesus. Secondly, another... Uh, uh, a hindrance to our discipleship process, uh, unfortunately, is an overload of information. You know, today, because of the internet, because of all the access we have, we can we have an overload of information. I mean, you can you can turn your phone on from morning till evening, listening to podcasts and uh, watching videos and all of that. And sometimes we mistakenly think that information is the same as transformation, and that is not true. You can be highly informed but by poorly transformed. I'll repeat that again. You can be highly informed but poorly transformed. 
So we mistakenly think, man, I know what Reverend so-and-so said and Prophet so-and-so and said and Apostle so-and-so and said. I know the latest Christian book. I know the latest Christian whatever, whatever. I know it all. What about your life? It's not about whether you have all the information. The issue is, is your life being transformed to becoming like your master? That is discipleship. Not the accumulation of information. In some cases, it's better you don't know what's going on in the Christian world. <laughs> and let your life be changed by God and His working through His Word and His Spirit. So don't let this uh, overload of information uh, cause you to mistakenly think that, yeah, I'm being changed. No. You could have all the information, but your life is not changed. It means nothing. Thirdly, the superficiality that we see uh, in, in certain parts of Christendom. You know, sometimes we think that having a good time in church is what discipleship is. Yeah, you, know, you go to church, you enjoy time. Because today church has all kinds of ways to excite emotions. We have LED walls. <laughs> we have all kinds of things uh, to excite your emotions, to uh, to make you feel good. Maybe for an hour or two hours. Now, if they can manage to do it for two hours, they're really good. <laughs> to keep you excited. And so, you get your fix on Sunday morning. And over the next seven days, it fizzles out. And you come back for your fix the next Sunday. But this is superficial Christianity. Because you're living from your Sunday morning fix to the next Sunday morning fix. The real issue is, is your life being changed? What happens Monday to Saturday in your life? The true effectiveness of that two hours that you spend in church on Sunday is determined by your life that you live Monday to Saturday. Because if whatever happens in church on Sunday morning does not result in the transformation of our, the way we live Monday to Saturday, then it's superficial. It has no impact, no effect. But we mistakenly think, I had a good time on Sunday, therefore, I'm progressing. And we measure the depth of our dif discipleship to the heightened level of our excitement in church it has nothing to do with each other. Are you listening? Well, the Bible says, no. <laughs> so we need to look past that and say, look, I, I want to really see what's happening in my life. Is my life really being changed? Otherwise, I'm, uh, if I'm just feeling good in church on Sundays and I think that's discipleship, that's not. Is my life changed? That's discipleship. And lastly, there is, of course, the pull of worldliness, the attractions, the distractions that come from the world that uh, try to keep us away from pursuing Christ-likeness, pursuing becoming more like Jesus. And we all have to contend with that. Uh, there is truly this pull, uh, uh, you know, from, from the world trying to say, why do you want to be like Jesus? He is outdated. You've got to be trendy. You've got to keep up with the times. And at the times, uh, you know, they don't, it's not cool to be like Jesus. Yeah. You're committed to being like Christ, regardless of what the world says. Amen. Because you know who he is. He is the eternal one. Times will come and go. Trends will come and go. What's in fashion will come and go. But you're committed to being like him. So we push past these things. Now before I close, I want, us to, I want, to, give, I want to give an overview of what Jesus said about being his disciple. So I'm going to run through 11 statements. So it's a lot. But don't worry, it's in the sermon notes and you can watch it. <laughs> you can listen to it. But I want to give, you an, oh, give us an overview. This is the high level picture of what it means, of what Jesus said a disciple would look like. So don't worry if you don't write all 11 down, but just get the high, high level picture. We will get into the details in the weeks to come. So I'm going to read these 11 statements. And these are all based on what Jesus said. Number one. 
The disciples goal is to become just like their teacher and master, Jesus Christ. Number two. Disciples must be willing to face ridicule, false accusation and persecution just as their master did. In other words, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, be prepared. They'll treat you the way they treated me. Number three. The disciple is not greater or above their master. This means the disciple must walk the same path their master walked. There are no shortcuts for the disciple. Number four. When a disciple is perfectly, thoroughly trained, then they will be like their master. We'll talk on this next Sunday. Number five. A disciple believes and lives by their master's word. Number six. A disciple's love for the master must supersede their love for any other earthly relationship. Number seven. A disciple must carry their cross daily. The cross represents a place of suffering, separation, and sacrifice. Number eight, a disciple must forsake all for the sake of their master. This means the disciple's love for their master is greater than their love or affection for anything else in the Number nine, the way others will know we are disciples of Jesus is by the love we show through our lives. Number ten, a disciple will bear much fruit so that the Father will be glorified through their lives. Number eleven, disciples will do the works of healing, miracles, and deliverance as Jesus did. Still want to sign up? In John chapter 6, we have a very interesting situation. Ah, Jesus had just finished multiplying the loaves and the bread, and great multitudes had come. They said, hey, free food, come. All these crowds were gathering. And then suddenly Jesus started talking about saying, if you really want to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Whoa. What is going on? Now, of course, he was speaking figuratively. And as he began to explain it to the, his audience, slowly the congregation disappeared. And I can only imagine, maybe he was left with just the twelve. From about 5,000 to 12. And he turns around to his disciples. He says, will you also go away? Because the people could not take what he was saying. So he asked them, will you also go away? And Peter replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So this call to disciple, being a disciple, is the actual call for every person. He said, go make disciples. We start out by believing in Jesus, but that's not the end. He's invited us to be his disciple, to grow, to become like him. But he spelled it out very clearly for us. This is what it's going to entail. And I've just given us an overview. But we must commit to that. Yes, Lord. I'm willing to commit to this call to be a disciple. So will you say yes to the call to be a disciple of Jesus Christ?
But I want to encourage us. You see, this transformative process is not dependent on our ability. The only thing he asks is, you come, make yourself available. But the Bible says, it is God who works in us, making us willing and able to do his will. God's going to work in you. But you and I must say, I'm okay. I'm ready. Please do it. So it doesn't matter what our background is. Some of you say, Pastor, you don't know what my background is. What I come from. You're saying, I'm going to go to becoming like Jesus. That's impossible. Maybe your mother told you it's impossible. I'm just joking. It, it may seem so difficult that, that God could take your life and transform it into the likeness of his son Jesus. But that's why he's God. That's why he's God. He can do it for any person. In anyone's life, he can do it. We just have to say, Lord, I'm willing. I want you to work in me. And he will do the work. Transforming us to becoming like Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's rise up to our feet. Worship team, please come. So this morning, I just want to, us to consider the call to be a disciple. Jesus said, it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher or like his master. That's all. That's all I'm asking. It's enough. The question is, are you and I willing to come in to becoming like Jesus? Yeah. He'll do the work, but we have to give him the permission. Say, yes, Lord, do it. I'm in. And I'm 100% in. And he'll do the work. So as we take these few moments to look to Jesus, I want you to pray in your hearts. This is not about me telling you what to do, but it's a, your response to his call. Saying, yes, Jesus, I want to be like you. I'm willing to be your disciple. I'm committing here this morning that I'm going to be a disciple. And maybe uh, many of us have already started on this journey, and it's true. Uh, that we've started on this journey, but just say, Lord, I'm on this journey, and I'm staying with it. I'm not turning back. Amen? So please take a few moments to pray, and then our worship team is going to lead us in a song that we could sing as a prayer, as a dedication, and then I'll come back and just pray for us. No turning back, no turning back. 
No turning back, yeah, no turning back. No turning back, one more time, sing. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided, I have decided to follow. Only you, only you, I have decided. Whatever goes to follow, yes, I have, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning. No matter what challenge you face, this is a commitment to Jesus Christ. And I remember way back in school, I, the Lord touched my life and I was just about 12 years of age and right here in Bishop Cotton's. When I made a decision to follow Christ, the first thing in school, people started calling me Holy Joe. Started giving me all names because I, I was all in. So they got started calling me names. Teachers were upset. The principal called me one day. Now, imagine in a Christian school being called up by the principal saying, Ashish, you're talking too much about Jesus. The principal. In all of these, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to, four decades, I think now, there's only one time I thought of quitting. I think it was on my 10th standard. I've been a Christian for two years. I said, this is enough. I really remember one morning, I got up, I said, Lord, I'm not going to follow you anymore. Only once. But that day, I opened my Bible. I went to Psalm, I think, uh, Psalm 77. And the psalmist said, God, I'm looking at the unrighteous. They are prospering in their ways. Look at me. But he said, but this was my anguish. I remember what God has done. And it was that lasted for about 15 minutes. <laughs> I said, God, never more will I ever think of not following Jesus. Never more. And I remember going to college. In college, again, you know, uh, you face all kinds of things. There's all kinds of pressures in college. Some of your college students. I said, I'm following Jesus. I'm not afraid that I believe in Jesus. I will talk about Jesus. If you want, you can join me, but I'm not joining you. Amen. But that's the kind of commitment God is asking. I have decided to follow Jesus. I mean, you go through life. You face all kinds of situations, challenges, pressures. But you're committed. You are a disciple. That's what makes you a disciple. Because you're carrying your cross every day. Amen? And you're committed. And that's the kind of people I want to invite you to be. Committed to Jesus Christ. No turning back. No turning back. Amen? I want to take a moment just to pray. You know, if you've been here, you're here for the first time, you've never received Jesus Christ, 
you make a decision. I want to invite you to make a decision to follow Jesus. Like the rest of us here, we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose up again the third day. And he's the one who saves us from our sins. He's the one who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's the one who's made us sons and daughters of God. And you can do that too if you've never made that decision. I'm going to lead in a simple prayer. And if you would like to do that this morning with me, if you've never done it before, you can just pray the simple prayer with me and let Jesus Christ be the Lord and Savior of your life. Let's just pray together. If you've never done this before, and those watching us live, wherever you are, if you've never received Jesus into your life, you're welcome to do this with me this morning. Just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. That you were buried. That you rose up again. I believe you're alive today. And I want to follow you the rest of my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anyone, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time. We want to celebrate with you. So if you don't mind, just raise your hand where you are. If you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time here in this auditorium, uh, just raise your hand where you are. Nothing to be ashamed of. Anybody here? I don't see any hands here, but if you, uh, if you have prayed, then I see one hand right up here. God bless you, right up here. Uh, our greeters will come up to you. I'll give you a welcome packet. Anybody else? We have a, 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 a pack of books that we want to give you, resources that we want to give you to help you in your journey. So they'll come and give it to you, and you can receive it. Just write your name on the card that they give you, and we'll, uh, somebody will call you from the church office and tell you how to use those resources. I'm going, to pr I'm going to close in prayer with a, benedic with a benediction. Uh, life group leaders, our worship team, ministry team, could you please come make yourself available here? So if you need personal prayer, we believe that as disciples of Jesus, we do the works that Jesus did. We heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely we have received, freely we give. Amen? So we believe in doing that. So if you need prayer to be healed, delivered, set free, anything, our ministry team leaders will be here. Come on, nobody's coming up, please. <laughs> medicine team come on be here uh, you can come receive prayer from any any one of them they'll pray with you minister to you and the Lord Jesus will work through their lives touching you uh, and, and meeting your needs so you're welcome to do that as soon as we dismiss please come receive prayer and ministry you need, may need healing you may need another miracle in your life and there are so many stories of miracles uh, when I was there at, in this morning earlier in the morning in our East service on my way out people telling stories you know, this happened, this happened, this happened. So it's amazing that God is doing wonderful things. Not just the testimonies we shared, but so many other things that God is doing in the lives of His people. And He's working through His people. We close with benediction. And Father, we just thank you for this morning. And Lord, let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with each one. Continue with each one always in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.